Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I can see that we've got a number of observers at this hearing this afternoon. You're all very welcome. Just to remind you, this is a public hearing, which means that you are entitled to attend. Um, if you feel the need to leave please, or, or come and go, please do so discreetly. But as I said, it's a public hearing, and that's the best way that, um, as you'd appreciate, justice can be done and be seen to be done. I'm going to take some introductions <laughs> first. So, um, Mrs. Green, you're here today. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Mrs. Green. Um, and you are represented by Mr. Frew this afternoon, is that right? Uh, that's right, George. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. And for Hot Drinks Limited, I see we have the witnesses present. Thank you very much. And represented by Mr. Legrantney. Ah, thank you, Judge. Thank you very much indeed. Right, OK. Time is quite tight this afternoon. Um, we have got to get through a fair amount of business. Um, You'll be pleased to know that I've had the opportunity of pre-reading the bundle so that I feel I've got a sense. But the first thing we have to do before we start the evidence is to understand the issues. The reason we need to do that, of course, as you'll appreciate, is unless I know what the issues are, I can't make a decision based on those issues. So I'm going to turn to you, Mr. Frew, first of all. I notice, Mr. Frew, that I don't see in the bundle uh, a case management order. Was there a previous case management hearing, or is this simply a fast-track case that's found its way to a final hearing straight away? It, uh, it's regrettable, Judge. I, I'm in complete agreement with you on that basis, but the position is right um, on the basis that there hasn't been uh, a, a previous case management um, uh, hearing, uh, and so it has just been fast-tracked. Um, Super. All right. Well, what, what I do raise, though, Judge, is that the parties perhaps could have provided you a list of issues, um, uh, and there isn't. But we're, we're prepared, uh, and I think we have an understanding of the issues together. I'm glad to hear that. It is disappointing I don't see a list of issues, but that's the purpose of now. Let's see if we can sort the issues out um, for the rest of the afternoon. So, Mr Frew, I've seen the document, which is your case. Let's just quickly turn it up so we've got an eye on it. It's at page seven of the bundle. So this is the, the core part of your ET1 claim. Actually, page six helps me. You've ticked, you, um, Mrs. Green has ticked various boxes. Let's look through this, shall we? Unfair dismissal. Uh, the claim is one of unfair dismissal. Of course, it is for the respondent to establish the reason for dismissal. Mr. Ilan Garatni, can I ask you, what is the reason that you're relying upon for dismissal? Conduct, Judge. Conduct. Uh, claimant, as I understand the case, is not accepting that that was the genuine reason for dismissal. What the, does the claimant the, say the reason right. is? Uh, well, it, that it's uh, unfair on the ordinary unfair basis, uh, unfair dismissal basis, uh, but also that it's got a taint of disability discrimination to it, Judge. Um, it's pleaded as direct currently, and I do propose to make an amendment application to include a Section 15 claim, that is, a, a discrimination arising from her disability. Um, uh, I've discussed that uh, in, in very short terms with my learned friend, given the time constraints. Uh, he'll no doubt uh, identify uh, him and his client being uh, ambushed. Uh, well, but I'll make my submission when you give me permission to do so, Judge, if you do. We'll come back to that. Let's just run through what the issues are. So we've got unfair dismissal, respondent says it's conduct, that claimant's not accepting that and says there's a disability taint. So there's, there's presumably allegations of procedural unfairness. Could you, Mr. Frew, just highlight the key elements of that so we can all keep an eye out for them? It, well, uh, Judge, you, you'll see that the investigation, uh, as carried out by Mr. Sparks, um, uh, is considered to be uh, wholly inadequate. Um, and the procedural issues within that uh, are, are that uh, the investigation was not uh, e e even-handed, it was, it was one-sided, it's certainly the allegation, um, uh, and it wasn't a reasonable investigation in order to uh, uh, identify a reasonable belief in the claimant's guilt. Now, I, I, I appreciate I'm veering into uh, the substantive issue somewhat, but I only do so to, to assist the tribunal yeah, generally. Um, the, the next point, uh, Judge, is the lack of independence um, in relation to the uh, uh, disciplining officer, um, uh, given that she was a complainant, although she did not give evidence in relation to the complaint, but she did raise the complaint, uh, and also that the uh, information 
necessary for the disciplinary procedure and relied upon by the respondent wasn't provided to the claimant until the hearing and she was provided with a remarkably short amount of time to consider that right. to the extent okay. she couldn't possibly. Good. That's a good highlight for us to look at with the witnesses. Um, it's, sorry, Judge, in relation to the appeal, if I just, I'll say very briefly, yeah. it was a platitude. It wasn't a rehearing. It doesn't need to be a rehearing, does it? it? It wasn't a review. It was a platitude. Right. It, but okay. I agree with you. It doesn't need to be. It could even be a, 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 a bit of both. Uh, but I say, well, the claimant says it was neither. Thank you. Mr. Ilan Grantney, Polky. Are you alleging that if there's an unfairness here, there should be a Polky reduction? You know what that means. It means that had there been no unfairness, there would have been a dismissal anyway? We are, Judge. We will be pursuing the arguments. Thank you very much. Now, there is a tick of the box for notice pay. So that suggests, uh, Mr. Frew, that you're also arguing for wrongful dismissal. Uh, absolutely right, Judge. And I, I don't need to highlight to you the, the difference in the test, given that it's wrongful dismissal that's pleaded as well. Let's just check that I've got that right. Um, wrongful dismissal requires me to be satisfied that there was in fact uh, repudiatory conduct by the claimant, not just a belief. Yes. We can come on to that. Holiday pay is ticked as well. What do you say about that, Mr. Free? It's withdrawn, Judge. Um, it, well, I, I'll leave it at that. No, no need to go further than that. It's right, withdrawn. okay. Direct discrimination, you've mentioned, that's disability because that's what the claimants identified. I'm pleased to see that that's an issue that um, the respondent accepts in the ET, in the defence document. Right, so, right. so there's no issue but that the claimant does have the disability of anxiety and depression. Indeed. Thank you, I'm grateful for that. So direct discrimination, Mr Frew, you appreciate less favourable treatment. As I understand it, that is the dismissal. It is. I have to compare the claimant with someone else. I, you don't have an actual person to compare with. It's a hypothetical comparator that's being relied upon, Judge. Uh, please forgive the pleadings. They don't identify they don't. precisely what that uh, hy hy hypothetical comparator is. Uh, but if I can put it to you in very simple terms yep. again, it's an employee in the same position as the claimant who needs time off, but not as a result of a mental impairment. Right, OK. And when I say time off, Judge, you'll identify from the papers the reasonable adjustments which were provided okay. to her as uh, having uh, time to come in later so that she could take her medication and an extra period of time for her lunch break running to 90 minutes. Thank you. So we've got direct discrimination as an allegation um, to look at. Now, let's wheel back and look at what you said to me was an application to amend for section 15, which is discrimination arising from disability. Yes. So let's just work that through. The less, the, the unfavorable treatment is the dismissal. You, what do you say then is the basis for your section 15 claim? Yes, we, Judge. We have to find something arising from disability. Uh, and yes, uh, and if I concentrate on that something, it, it, it's the very allegation itself. And I appreciate that the claimant identifies that uh, her, it, her very clear response is that she simply did not do as is alleged. Yeah. Now, it, it, if there's a finding that clearly has been by the respondent, yes. uh, what I'd ask the tribunal to consider is that there's something arising from her disability is the potential for lack of uh, memory, given that she suffers, and it's accepted, of course, uh, from anxiety and depression, and that there may be a certain comfort in holding her phone, which may well be against the policy that's relied upon by the respondent in this case, although I dare say it's incorrectly relied upon, but of course that'll be part of my cross-examination. So pause for a moment. What you're saying is that the, her use of the phone, to summarise, is connected to her disability. In other words, she needs that for some element of therapeutic benefit or just as a coping mechanism? A coping mechanism, and if I go even further with that judge, um, it, it, and if I'm enabled to do it, uh, I, I'll develop the, the argument um, uh, during the course of the hearing. Um, the use for WhatsApp uh, group is ultimately communication with the outside world yeah. and the support that that can offer. Can you identify in her witness statement where she makes reference to the fact that she needs it for that purpose or similar? Uh, I'm afraid, Judge, that it's not within her, her witness statement. Uh, 
and as I, I repeat, that there's a blanket denial of the allegations. Yes. But uh, I, again, I repeat that if there's a finding of fact that she did do as uh, was um, alleged, uh, that uh, there's consideration given to the something arising from. I understand that. Let me ask you, Mr. Elan Gratney, do you concede that we should have that amendment or do you object to it? Uh, we, we object to it. We, we resist the application to amend wholeheartedly. I'm grateful to my lender friend for flagging this issue up just before tribunal this morning. Uh, but that was the first uh, we heard of this amendment application. It, it's exceptionally late and um, there's no good reason as to why the claimant uh, couldn't have raised this issue before. Uh, leaving all the issues to do with lateness aside, um, it will cause huge prejudice to the respondent if the amendment is allowed. Uh, firstly, just as a, a matter of logistics, uh, cross-examination would have to be um, amended to reflect the fact there is a, a different claim uh, being brought as well as, of course, closing submissions as well. That's one point. But the, the bigger prejudice is that um, the respondent wouldn't be in a position to deduce any medical evidence that may speak to the issue as to whether the claimant's health condition uh, requires her to use for her mobile phone at certain times. So against that background, there's no opportunity for the respondent to properly respond to this allegation and seek to defend it. So against that background, we respectfully invite the tribunal to resist the amendment application, not only because it's exceptionally late, uh, but also because we don't have a proper opportunity to respond to the allegation in question. Thank it's you. Certainly not uh, in the interest of justice. I think I've heard enough from that. Can I take a moment to consider? I have to give you a decision now in relation to that application to amend. There are two famous cases that we look at. A case called Selkent, the Selkent Principles, and a more recent case called Vaughan and Modality. They tell us, they tell me, the judge, how to approach a question of an amendment. I need to look at the nature of the amendment, the timing of it, relevant time limits, but really, most importantly, what prejudice might arise if I allow that amendment to take place. This isn't simply a case of relabeling the existing facts with another legal headline. It's more than that, I decide, and that is because uh, Mr. Frew has quite fairly accepted that he's, in effect, leading new evidence about the connection the claimant would put on the, her use of the mobile phone connected to her disability. Um, it seems to me that almost inevitably I'm going to um, conclude that that would be fresh evidence that the respondent is going to find it difficult, if not impossible, to deal with today, now that we're at the final hearing. I have to say this, I may say it more than once during the course of this hearing, it's disappointing that we don't see this as having been an issue addressed by the parties, asked the tribunal before today for it to be an amendment. The claimant has lost the opportunity um, to have put that before the tribunal today. Um, had the parties and their advisers approached that more um, comprehensively in the run into the hearing, it might have been a different outcome. But as things stand, I'm going to refuse that amendment. Application is to Frew. Um, and we proceed upon the basis of a direct discrimination claim only in Thank relation you, to disability. Right, so that um, deals with that. This is stage one, of course, this is liability. Of course, we then need to look at valuation. What I propose to do, unless either of you disagree, um, is to look at the question of remedy as and when we get to that stage, if necessary, once we've looked at my liability decision. We can pick that up at the end. Any objections to that? No, Judge. No, Judge. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. OK. So that's the first phase. I now am satisfied oh, think, the, of the issues. Forgive me, Judge, for, for interrupting your note. Uh, it always surprises me when I see these in pleadings, when there's no real basis, uh, that there's a, a, an alternative argument put forward by the respondent on the basis of a dismissal from some other substantial reason uh, based on trust and confidence. I just wondered if my learned friend had a, 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 a sensible position in relation to that alternative argument. I can help with that, Judge. We're no longer pursuing that alternative argument, so conduct is the only argument we're relying on. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. That level of cooperation is extremely helpful and allows me to focus on the key issues and get to a decision, hopefully, during the course of this hearing. Thank you for that. Right. OK, so we move from that to the next phase, which is evidence. I 
going to, we've, we've already outlined a key timetable here and we're proposing on dealing with this evidence such that we'll take a break around about 3.45. That means both of you will be kept by me to a timeline. Um, I know that barristers, and I don't point at either of you, um, are notoriously bad with their time estimates, but we're going to keep to this timeline and get to that break. So um, this is uh, an unfair dismissal with the respondent having to establish the reason for dismissal. So we'll hear the respondent's evidence first. And I think Mr. Sparks, the line manager, is going to give evidence first. Indeed, if I can call Mr. Sparks. Thank you very much. Mr. Sparks, could you come forward? If you stay standing, I think my usher is going to allow you to um, take the affirmation. Please read this aloud. I do solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Super. Mr. Sparks, come and take a seat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. If you can keep your answers loud and clear so that we can all hear you, that would be very helpful. And if you listen to the question carefully, uh, and the barrister will give you the opportunity of providing you as with an answer before the next question, hopefully. So, if I can just make it clear, ordinarily in a tribunal process, you would not read your witness statement out um, because that would have been something that's pre-read. Given the length of these statements and the need for us all to get a good sense of what the evidence is, I am going to ask you to read your statement out. So if you do that, uh, and then we'll have some cross-examination. I, Mark Sparks, Assistant Store Manager at Hot Drinks Limited at Olympus House, Royal Edmonton Spa, Warwickshire, take oath and will say as follows. I am employed as the assistant store manager at the Leamington store of the company. I have been employed with the company for two years. I am Miss Green's line manager and have been throughout her employment with the company. Mrs Green approached me on or around the 29th of September 2023 to inform me that she has been diagnosed with anxiety and depression by her GP. I immediately tried to understand the extent of her condition and asked how I could assist. It was agreed that reasonable adjustments would be put in place, namely allowing her to start later and a longer lunch. For the avoidance of doubt, these adjustments were my suggestions as I attempted to assist Mrs Green. On the 1st of November 2023, I was informed by the store manager, Sophie Wood, that she had witnessed Mrs Green use her mobile phone to access social media during shifts. Uh, this ultimately led to customers leaving the store without placing an order on three occasions. With this information, I immediately commenced an investigation. As part of this investigation, I spoke with colleagues who worked on the same shifts as Mrs Green. I obtained uh, statements from Mrs Tina Lee, who confirmed she had witnessed Mrs Green not only use her phone, but to display rude and aggressive behaviour towards customers. I obtained another statement from Greg Bailey, who confirmed that he had witnessed Mrs Green on two occasions access social media on her phone whilst on ship. This uh, subsequently led to customers not placing any orders. On the same day, 1st of November 2023, I conducted an investigatory meeting with Mrs Green on the 1st of November 2023 to address the allegations. Within this meeting, I informed Mrs Green of the allegations, I also referred to statements from colleagues, a customer statement, and also the company's mobile phone policy. Mrs Green denied all allegations and confirmed that she was not aware of any incidents where she had been rude to customers or that she had kept customers waiting due to being on her phone. A part of my thorough investigation, I also created feedback forms for customers to complete. On the 4th of November 2023, I received a feedback form from Mr. Joseph Lennon. He confirmed that he was disappointed in the service and confirmed that Mrs. Green was on her phone during shift, as well as becoming rude and aggressive towards him when he challenged her. With this additional information, it was my view that there was a case to answer for, and Mrs. Green be invited to a disciplinary in accordance with the company's disciplinary policy. I categorically deny that I was unhappy Mrs Green was receiving special treatment due to her diagnosis. 
given I was the one who tried to assist her during this period. Thank you, Mr Sparks. Mr Frew, cross-examination. Uh, thank you very much, Judge. Um, Mr Sparks, can I just... Um, let's see what we can agree on. My understanding is that the respondent employs 50 employees. Is that correct? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes. But I only work in the Lennington store. OK, thank you. So it may help you then, if you're not aware, what it says at page 27 of the bundle. Turn to page 27 of the bundle with me, please. And look at paragraph 3. And just to put it into context, these are the grounds of resistance or the defence to the claimant's claim, which has been provided by the respondent. Yes? Yes, that's correct. Right. Now, what it says is that there are 50 employees at paragraph 3. Yes? You yes. have no reason to doubt that. No. Uh, and there's uh, the engagement of five casual workers across a number of locations. Yes. And do, do, does your location engage casual workers, Mr Sparks? Uh, one, yes. One, OK. All right, thank you. And um, that within the, your branch, there were 12 employees at the time. Yes. Thank you. Now, we can see that uh, on a general basis, what is said at paragraph four, just below, yes. it is that it's an inclusive business. But my understanding from the claimant is that in the period of time that you had been there, you had not received any education or training in relation to discrimination. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Nothing at all in the period that you were at the respondent prior to the claimant's dismissal, yes? Yes, that, that's correct. But yeah. I, I still stand by the statement that it's made there. Yes. And uh, what about training in relation to carrying out an investigatory meeting? Did uh, you receive any training on that at all? No, Colleen's investigation is the first one I have to take. First one? Oh, yes. Uh, and is there an HR department that you can receive advice from? Uh, no. No. And you didn't seek advice anywhere else, is that correct? No, I, I didn't, because I thought I understood what, what I was being asked to investigate. Yes, and what was the basis of your understanding as to how an investigation should be carried out? What was that based on? The, the need to hold a meeting to understand whether the allegations that were being made were... Uh, substantiated or whether they might have been substantiated to move forward to, to the remainder of the disciplinary policy which the company has. Yes, thank you. Now, what I also understand from the claimant is that she believes that there's CCTV within the shops for a number of different reasons such as the protection of staff, the protection of customers. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, there is, yeah. And you've told us that your knowledge is limited to your store, your coffee shop. Yes, that's right. Just for confirmation, there is CCTV recording within your shop. Is that right? There are CCTV cameras, yes. And again, for confirmation, you didn't look at that CCTV footage during the course of your investigation or at all. Is that correct? It is, but I, I, I didn't need the CCTV evidence because I've got the two statements from Colleen's colleagues which confirmed um, on an unbiased basis what, what had occurred. And it sounds from your answer that, like, as if you could have looked at the CCTV footage. Yet, you say you didn't need to, but you could have. I, I could have, but I don't know if where Colleen was stood when she was on the phone would have been covered by CCTV. You would never know without looking at it though, would you? And you didn't. I didn't, but I know, I know where the cameras are. And I can't be sure that that would have been covered. Can't be sure? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. That seems to be the theme of the investigation that you carried out, Mr Sparks, I might say. Now, we know that you're the assistant stall manager Yes? That's right. And um, the respondent has accepted that the claimant is disabled and therefore has the protection of the Equality Act. Do you understand that? I do, yeah. You do? I do. Okay. And she informed you in September last year of her disability. Yes? She did, and I thought I'd been supportive of that. Thank you. 
And what you also say is that you carried out a full assessment of her condition. Uh, and what we're also told is that you obtained regular occupational health reports. Yes, that's right. You didn't obtain a regular occupational health report or an occupational health report in relation to the claimant at all, did you? We did, we obtained two reports. Where are they? Uh, they're, they're not within the window. Do you know why? Uh, I, I don't. But you're professionally represented, Mr Sparks. This is a discrimination claim, but the occupational health reports are not in there. They aren't, no. No, all right. Well... So, so let me just ask, is that something that you've been asked to provide, or is it simply something that has just missed um, anybody paying attention to it? Uh, I, I, I don't know if we have been asked to provide or not. Now, uh, and just uh, uh, judge largely, um, just for identification purposes, the issue of the occupational health reports uh, is at page 28 at paragraph 10. That's paragraph 10 of the grounds of resistance. Sorry, uh, I think it's actually paragraph 9 including obtaining regular occupational health reports. And for the first time, we've been told that there were two. Did you read those, Mr Sparks? I did, I did You yes. did. Now, how does the claimant's disability affect her? What did we told from the occupational health reports? Not just one, two. Um, uh, it, it informed us that she needed more time to prepare for her day. Um, and, and also uh, perhaps longer breaks throughout the day in order to, to manage her anxieties. Does her depression and anxiety lead to memory loss? Not, not that I can call. I don't have the report in front of me. and it, It's been several months since I, I read it. Is the answer, I don't know? The answer, the answer is that he doesn't recall. Yes. Does she have a level of security in using her phone? Uh, again, without having a report in front of me, I can't, can't call that. Can her disability lead to her presenting as being absent-minded? Again, I can't recall that. You can't recall that. And can her disability lead to her having frustration and coming across as potentially rude. Uh, I can't call what the report said about that. Did any of those aspects ever feature in your investigation, Mr Sparks? Any of them? The disciplinary investigation? Of course. Um, no, because they didn't. No. They weren't the allegations that I was looking into. OK, thank you. Now. You enabled, as a reasonable adjustment, for the claimant to come in later by one hour in order to take medication, yes? Yes. So you knew that she was taking medication for her disability, yes? I did, yes. Uh, and uh, have an extended lunch break to 90 minutes, yes? Yes. And do you agree that that could be viewed as preferential treatment? There's a good reason for it, but it's preferential treatment. It is, yes, but I was following the guidance of the report and also the, the ideas that Colleen was receptive to when we had this discussion about adjustments. Uh, is lunchtime when she takes her break? Um, For 90 minutes? Her, her breaks vary depending on who was on shift that day. And equally, I'm, I don't always work with Colleen. We're not always on the same ship, so I can't say conclusively when she takes her 90 minutes. Yes. But what I do know is it is 90 minutes. It, right, OK. You, you see, what, what I'm putting to you, Mr Sparks, is that because of the claimant's disability, that being a mental impairment, mm -hmm. you didn't understand it, you didn't believe it, and it became a nuisance, her having that preferential treatment. What do you say to that? <coughs> I don't, don't agree with that at all. It, it's correct that 
I'm not a medical expert, and that's why I rely on the occupational health reports to help me understand. Yes, we can see that reliance. Um, and it, but it certainly wasn't a, a nuisance at, at all. I, I understood that Colleen had this uh, disability and she needed these adjustments. So we put those in place. And I'll finish in relation to the disability with this, Mr. Sparks. If she had an obvious disability that you understood, yes. you may well not have dismissed her. You didn't believe her disability because you can't see it. It's a mental impairment. The easiest way to deal with that isn't to carry on with preferential treatment, but it's to dismiss her, and that's what you did. You engineered her dismissal, didn't you? N not at all, and equally, I didn't make the, the dis dis dismissal decision. Um, I just carried out the investigation into the allegations that were made against her, and those allegations had no bearing on her disability or the adjustments that she had in place. Thank you. Now, let's have a look at the uh, complaint that you received. So what we've got, please turn to the witness statement of Ms Wood. And tell me when you've got there, please. Yes, I'm there. And have a look at her paragraph two. Yes. She tells us that on the 1st of November last year, she informed you that she had witnessed the claimant using her mobile phone to access social media during shifts. And also that this ultimately led to customers leaving the store without placing an order on three occasions. That identifies that Ms Wood was a complainant to you, doesn't it? Yes. And it's perhaps not a question for you, but how could, do you say, Ms Wood could be independent in arriving at a decision in relation to the claimant's guilt when she's a complainant? I, I, I don't know if I can answer that question. I, it wasn't me that po appointed her as the disciplinary officer. Yes. And you've had no training on the matter. So not a question for this witness, I don't think. You can ask Ms Wood that question. Fair enough, Judge. Thank you. Now, you also, did you speak to Ms Leith? Turn to page 39 with me, please. Yes, I'm there. Did I speak to Ms Lee? How, uh, how, yes. or how, how did you obtain this witness statement? Um, I asked Ms Lee to, to write down her account and then sign it. And, and when did you get this? It's undated. I, I, I cannot recall the exact date, but it, it would have been shortly after being told by Sophie that um, this allegation came about. Sorry, say that again. I don't understand what you said. Say that again, please. So I, I would have got this in this statement, um, I, I imagine, shortly after being told of the allegation by um, Sophie. So, so I'll ask again, who obtained the witness statement? Was it Ms Wood or was it you? M me. Right. Uh, and did you speak to Ms Leaf about the detail of the witness statement? Uh, or did you just accept it at face value? I, I took this, this statement and, and that is what I relied upon. You haven't quite answered the question. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Did you take this statement at face value or did you investigate further by speaking with Ms Leaf about what she was saying? I. Uh, I didn't investigate any further than taking this no. statement. No. So you, you wouldn't understand, because you didn't ask her, what, what a display of a rude and aggressive behaviour actually is. What is it? What did the claimant do that was rude and aggressive? Is your answer, I don't know? Hold on, let the witness it, it, not Forgive it, me, Judge. It, well, I, I would say it, it's rude of, of any employee to be on their phone when customers are asking to be served. 
Okay, that's, I'll rephrase the question. Th that's, the witness has said, sorry, Judge. The witness has said, I witnessed Ruben aggressive behaviour. Yeah. Leaving aside the fact she may have been using a phone, at that time, did you believe that rude and aggressive meant anything other than using a phone? I. I had no reason to believe that it was anything other than that. Okay, thank you. So, I'm sorry, I'll ask... Probably the answer that you wanted, so I think you Yes, yeah, fair enough, Judge. <laughs> now, uh, in relation... Uh, three, three, three more minutes, uh, Judge, I wonder if I could go, have a slightly longer than that, but I'll be a, a very much shorter period of time with, my next, with the next witness, well. if I may. Um, now, if that's all right, Judge, but I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Now, um, you also had the uh, witness statement of Mr. Bailey. That's at page 40. Yes. Uh, he says he can't remember the dates of any incidents, but that she was using her phone while customers were waiting. <coughs> and again, did you take this at face value, just as you did with the other witness, Ms. Lee? Yes, I, I, I only relied on this, this statement. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, you uh, also had, if you turn please to page 43. Yes. A customer feedback form. And my understanding is that these are not generally filled out. That's right. It was filled out for the purposes of the investigation. Is that correct? It was, but I think it's generally a good idea that we should have had a feedback form. Okay. Now, who's Mr. Lennon? He's a, a customer. Do you know him? Personally, no. You don't? No. All right. So, if he were a serial complainant who enjoys completing customer feedback forms in a negative way, you would have no idea. He, he's just a customer. That, that's, that's all I know. He, he's a customer that, that filled in the form and submitted it to us. Right. Well, how many other people completed a customer feedback form? This is the only one that, that I've seen uh, when I did my investigation. How did you come by it? Sorry? So let me rephrase that. Were there other forms? About Colleen, no. So how many, so <coughs> I'm, I don't quite understand. Is, is Mr. Lennon the only person, the only customer who completed a form, a customer feedback form? He is about Colleen, yeah. Well, did a cu any other customers complete a form? Please don't rely on it just being about the claimant. Did any other customer complete a form? No, I haven't seen any other feedback form. You haven't? So no. there's one? It's based on one? The, the, it is, yes. All right. What, what Mr. Lennon says is that she was violent. Yes. And aggressive. You changed that during the course of the proceedings which led to her dismissal. Why or what does violent mean? Um, well, I, I can't speak for Mr Lennon in, in what he meant by violent, but he used the word aggressive, which was a word that others had used. Um, so I suppose I relied upon aggressive more than violent. But if we look at the investigatory meeting that's an, a minute has lasted for eight minutes is that correct uh yes an eight minute long investigation meeting all right D do you think that you gave her a reasonable period of time to go through this investigation with the claimant who faced losing her job I, eight minutes i i feel like i, I gave colleen the opportunity to, to give her account of what was alleged so and if that took eight minutes then yes you didn't put that she was violent to her, did you? I, I don't recall, no, these notes aren't verbatim, but I don't, don't recall asking her if she was violent. Well, how could it be an even-handed investigation if you don't even ask her about the allegation which is being made about her? I, I do ask her if she recalls being aggressive. Right. Um, and, and violent and aggressive aren't dissimilar um, characteristics. Certainly not to you, it seems. No. Okay, all right, thank you. Now, did you ask any other members of staff 
save for the three people who came forward to you. That is Ms Wood, Mr Bailey and Ms Leith. Now, if anybody else asks, because there's 12 members of staff, you just relied upon those who came to you as opposed to carrying out an investigation <coughs> of all the staff about an allegation of serious misconduct. Uh, yes, I just, I just had those three accounts. Why? Why didn't you extend your investigation beyond them? Because I thought if I, have, if I have three people, then that is the allegation substantiated. How much further do I need to go? Yes, but that's my understanding. It's about numbers. Because what the claimant did is provide her own witness statement, didn't she, from her, her colleague. She did. Who is saying the polar opposite of the others, yes? Yes, but I, I wouldn't class him as a, uh, perhaps a rather reliable witness. Would it have affected your investigation in any way if you had spoken to other people who also agreed with Mr King in identifying that the claimant didn't act as suggested? Well, I didn't speak to them, so I, I, don't, I don't know if that would have changed anything. You don't know? Very much. Uh, any, any final questions? Uh, no, thank you, Judge. Um, an opportunity for re-examination. As you know, in my practice is that I don't generally encourage it, but if there's any particular matter... Please say no, no re-examination, Judge. Thank you, that. Thank you very much. Mr. Scott, you're free to stand down for this. Thank you, Judge. No, don't. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. So now we move to Ms. Wood. You can come forward and stand by the witness table. I'll show you. Could you give the affirmation, please? Please read this aloud. I do solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please come to your seats. You can come forward. As I said, I'm going to ask you, outside of the moment, to read your witness statement to us so that we can understand your evidence before you. I, Sophie Wood, store manager of Hot Drinks Limited, the respondent of Olympus House, Royal Leamington Spa, Warwickshire, take oath and will say as follows. I am employed as the store manager of the Leamington Spa. Leamington store of the respondent. I've been employed with the respondent for three years. On 1st of November 2023, I informed Mrs. Green's line manager, Mark Sparks, that I had witnessed her use her mobile phone to access social media during shifts. This ultimately led to customers leaving the store without placing an order on three occasions. I became involved again in this matter when I sent Mrs. Green an invite to disciplinary on 6th of November 2023 to be heard on 7th of November 2023. The allegations were that it was alleged that Mrs Green had, between 18th of October 2023 and the 31st of October 2023, used her personal mobile phone to access social media and WhatsApp during working hours, thereby keeping customers waiting to be served. It was alleged that Mrs Green had on five occasions between 18th of October 2023 and 31st of October 2023, kept customers waiting for excessive periods of time, thereby leading to them leaving the Leamington store without ordering anything. And it was alleged that Mrs Green had, on 27th of October 2023, become rude and aggressive towards a customer. During the hearing on 7th of November 2023, I provided Mrs Green with all evidence against her. This included minutes of the investigatory meeting held with Mr. Mark Sparks, statements from Mr Bailey and Mrs Leaf, a customer statement from Mr Lennon, and the company's mobile phone policy. I gave Mrs Green the opportunity to review these documents before proceeding with the hearing. She repeatedly mentioned that she had not had enough time to consider the documents. Notwithstanding the above, I proceeded as normal with the hearing as I felt the claimant had ample time to consider the documents provided. Mrs Green denied any wrongdoing and subsequently provided me with a statement from her colleague Arthur King. I'm aware that Mrs Green and Arthur King have a very close relationship. I recall the statement supporting Mrs Green, which I, which I expected, given the nature of their relationship. Therefore, I did not factor this statement into my decision. Mrs Green continuously denied all allegations against her, despite the evidence against her. 
On the basis of the evidence available to me, I made the decision to terminate Mrs Green's employment without notice, given the seriousness of the allegations. I provided her with the outcome letter within the meeting immediately after communicating the decision to her. She was afforded the right to appeal the decision. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you, Judge. Um, but please, uh, Ms Wood, turn to page 44 of the bundle. And let me know when you've got there, please. I've got there. Now, let's look at the allegation. So uh, the, uh, I'd particularly like to look at the second bullet point on page 44 on five occasions between. You see that? Yeah. Where does the evidence of five occasions come from? So there were the instances that were reported by Mrs. Lee in her statement. Okay, so pause there. Yep. Let's have a look at Ms. Leaf's witness statement. Page 39. Thank you, Judge. Doesn't mention the amount of times that the claimant is alleged to have done anything. Do you agree? I do agree. So you're incorrect when you say it comes from Ms. Leaf. Do you agree? That specific allegation, yes. Okay. Forgive me, I interrupted you. And then Ms. I'll ask, ask again, where does the number five come from? So it's not from Ms. Leaf. Where Mr. does it come from? Mr. Bailey's witness statement. All right, let's do the same with Mr. Bailey. That's at page 40. Yep. <coughs> so there were two occasions where Mr. Bailey saw the claimant using her phone and led to customers leaving the store on both occasions. Yeah. So that's two. Right. And then I provided Mark Sparks with evidence of three other occasions. Well, in your witness statement, that's where you would identify that evidence. And you've just read out paragraph two. I witnessed her use her mobile phone to access social media during shifts. The three occasions is about people leaving the store. It's not about the use of her phone. So where does five come from? So in my statement, I said I'd witnessed her using her phone to access social media, which then led to three customers leaving sto the store, and there were two separate occasions from Mr. Bailey. Right, okay, thank you. Now, just on that, we've got evidence of one customer, that's Mr. Lennon. Of course, we've got a, a customer feedback report from him. Let's go to page 43. He didn't leave the store because of her use of a phone, according to his complaint, did he? It's not specified that he left the store. Yes, okay. So when you say at least three occasions, what, what's that based on? From my witnessing, I saw the claimant on three different occasions using her mobile phones so on three different days. And about people leaving the store? So then as a result of that, I witnessed people waiting in line and then they left the store and it seemed as a direct result of her using her phone. Yes. It, from what you're saying, the vast majority of the allegation actually comes from you, doesn't it? It comes from Mark Sparks, who first investigated it, but then yes, my occasions as well. well Mr Sparks didn't see anything, apparently. It all comes, or the vast majority of it, comes from you. Do you agree? Of that specific allegation, yes. Can I be clear, did you provide Mr Sparks with a written statement of what you informed him? I did not provide a written statement. Given that the vast majority of the evidence comes from you, do you accept you couldn't possibly arrive at an independent consideration of the allegations? I don't... You have key importance in evidence against the claimant. I don't agree. There were three allegations put to the claimant and my evidence only formed one part of one of those allegations. And given our policy, any one incident would have been sufficient. Sorry, 
Uh, let me just try one more time. Well, you've got your answer. Well, you said it, uh, yeah. You said you believe it's only one part of three. Fair um, enough. I'll move on, Judge. Now, look at paragraph six of your witness statement. Yes. And what you say is that the claimant was given a, a, an opportunity to re review the documents before proceeding with the hearing. Yes? Yes. Uh, and that she uh, repeatedly mentioned that she had not enough time to consider the documents. Yes. Do you have, uh, have you had any training in relation to um, being a disciplining officer? No, I've had no training. Nothing at all? No. Would common sense identify to you that the person being uh, the subject of that disciplinary hearing must have a fair opportunity to consider the allegations against them? Yes, I agree. But given the vagueness of the statements, as you've already identified, only a few lines long, it felt sufficient time for her to consider them, and that's why I carried on. Yes. Of course, no, I just want to understand something. So in your statement, you say that she said, I don't have enough time to consider the statement. But yeah. I'm looking at the, the notes from the disciplinary hearing on page 47. Am I right that that statement couldn't appear in those notes? It doesn't appear in the notes, no. What's your view of that? I think, as, as Mr. Sparks said, they're not verbatim notes, and it does say that she carried on speaking after that and denied the allegations, and so it felt to me that she actually, even though she said she didn't have enough time, felt she was able to continue with the meeting. But anyway, you recall her saying, I don't feel it from that. Yes. Were you aware when she attended with you on the 7th of November last year that she was a disabled person? Yes. You were? And were you aware that her disability was depression and anxiety? Yes, I was aware. And somebody who is disabled with anxiety and depression was saying to you on a repeated basis, I haven't had enough time to consider the documents, and you consider that it was fair to continue without an adjournment beyond five minutes. Is that correct? The claimant carried on speaking, so I felt she was able to carry on. Yes. All right, thank you. Now, let's have a look at page 47 then together. This is the yep. hearing which lasted, my understanding is it was 17 minutes long. Yes. Yeah? So you say that you didn't lack independence, yeah? for the reasons that you've provided, okay? You, do you understand or did you understand that your decision was a reasonable belief of guilt based upon a reasonable investigation? Yes. Yeah? And you knew that the investigation was information provided by you, but not on a written basis, yes? Yes. By two of her colleagues, from a potential of 12 colleagues yes. who provided very short witness statements, yes? There are 12 employees and one casual worker at the store, yes. Uh, 13, yep. Yeah. There's CCTV footage which wasn't looked at, and you were aware of the CCTV footage? I'm aware of the CCTV in the store, however, it's not been working for the last month. For the last month from today, or the last month no, well, during the course of the hearing? During course of that so it hadn't been working during October of 2023 not working during October and did you inform the staff of that in case there was an incident or were the staff informed of that in case there was an incident of actual violence that could be caught on CCTV not at the store no. a lot of employees don't know there is necessarily um, the issue with the CCTV but I did report it to the company as a whole did you sorry CCTV wasn't working. Wasn't when did working. you find out that it wasn't working? So we looked at it actually close to the end of October. We don't regularly review it unless there's a reason to look at it. Uh, we happened to look at it for a separate incident and discovered it hadn't been working and there have been no recordings for the last few weeks. Thank you. And is it correct to say that you didn't consider her disability at all? in arriving at your decision? So 
the, her disability wasn't relevant to the allegations yes. that I put in. However, I did, when I invited her to a disciplinary hearing, suggest that if she did need any adjustment as a result of her disability to let me know, and she said nothing. But as you say, it wasn't relevant. Her disability, according to you, deciding whether or not she keeps her job, it was irrelevant to that decision-making process, yes? To using the mobile phone, yes. All right, thank you. And she did provide evidence from Mr King. We can see that at page 46. Yeah. Uh, that would be our call, Judge. Yes? Yes. But you discarded that effectively on a numbers game because there were three people to one. Is that right? It wasn't just on a numbers game. I had right. the evidence from other colleagues and I didn't think Mr King's statement was reliable and he says he's worked on many shifts with the claimant for the last five years but we were looking at a specific period in October Yes. where they didn't have a lot of overlap on shifts. Were you aware that you could have spoken to other employees to see their account of the way in which the claimant conducted herself? So I just used the investigation from Mark Sparks. I appreciate that you did that. I'm going to say that that was an utter wholesale failure on your part and Mr Sparks. Did you know, I'll ask the question again, it's a simple question, did you know that you could investigate further than Mr Sparks or did you not know that? So I We know you didn't. Yes, I could have investigated further, but I, when I asked if the claimant had anything to add, she didn't provide me with anything that I could go investigate further. Okay, and how did anybody know that she was looking at WhatsApp on her phone? So... Or social media, or Facebook? How did they know the contents of her phone? You'd have to ask the witnesses that. Well, I'd have to ask you, who didn't ask. So is the answer, you've got no idea? In terms of when I saw the claimant using her phone, I was in proximity, close proximity to her, and saw that she was using WhatsApp and other social media. I see. Well, that, that makes so, much sense. So the reason you know that you saw it for yourself? Saw it for myself. Now, you're the store manager. Yes. And does that mean you're above Mr Sparks' as assistant store manager? Yes. And did you ever say to Mr Sparks, when you saw the claimant, Operating against policy, can you ask her to stop doing that? Yes, I spoke to Mr Sparks on the 1st of November. Well, that was to engage a, a disciplinary process and start an investigation. Did you ever say to Mr Sparks, or indeed the claimant, don't do that? No. Why not? Because it first few couple of times that I saw it, I was busy and I hadn't reported it, and it was in quite close succession. When I saw it for a third time, I then reported to Mr Sparks, who's her line manager, for him to deal with. Right. So it was a matter of being too busy. And she wasn't suspended. She carried on working. Yes? Yes. And that was on the basis of a customer saying that she's not just rude, but violent and aggressive. Yes? Yes. Did you believe that she was? Violent wasn't included in my allegations. Well, why not? It's what the customer said. The customer notes came after the discussion with Mr Sparks. So my allegation didn't cover that particular incident. It covered one on the 27th. Forgive me, I don't understand. Does that mean that you did not consider the evidence of Mr Lennon? I did not. In arriving at your decision? I to dismiss it, the claimant. But it wasn't in my allegation specifically, no. Wow, yeah, thank you. And finally, when you um, dismissed the claimant, it was during the course of the 17-minute meeting, yes? Yes. And you provided her a letter. You can see that letter. Page 49 of our bundle. I'm grateful, Judge. You can see that letter, which had been pre-prepared and identified that she was being dismissed. Two parts to that. Was that pre-prepared? It was pre-prepared for the meeting, yes. It was predetermined that the claimant was going to be dismissed, wasn't it? It wasn't predetermined. I prepared the letter on the basis of the investigation material. And as I said, the claimant provided nothing further during the meeting for me to investigate. Had she, I would have gone and investigated that before giving the outcome. Can you tell me, was there any adjournment before handing the letter to her? 
Uh, and finally, please, on the basis that you made a finding that the claimant had committed an act of gross misconduct, was the only sanction open to you summary dismissal, in your view? On the basis of our policy and the number of allegations, yes, I thought it was only gross misconduct was suitable. Only. Uh, why wouldn't a, a, a warning have been suitable? It seemed that there were a number of allegations and our policy says that it can be gross misconduct and it is severe due to the potential loss of customers to the business yes. and damage and so I felt that gross misconduct was suitable. On, on the basis of your own evidence, you had watched her on three occasions and on two of those occasions you had said nothing. You're the boss. You didn't stop her. Not on those occasions. As I said, they were very close in succession. How would she reasonably know not to do it when the boss hasn't stopped her? We have a policy in place and all employees are able to look at that policy. Yes. And I understand from her meeting with Mr. Spark, she confirmed she had read that. But your job is to enforce that policy. That's why I ask, why wasn't a warning suitable? On the basis I consider there were so many allegations, it was gross misconduct. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any re-examination? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Wood, you're free to step down. Thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you. Mr. Trent. Your witness statement. You were the appeal officer. You can see your statement to page... 63. Just in the interest of time, we can see that you introduce yourself in relation to paragraphs 1 to 5 and you set them in the background. I'll just if you can read from paragraph 6 onwards, please. <clears throat> I wrote to the claimant on Thursday 9th of November 2023, inviting her to attend an appeal hearing via Microsoft Teams on Friday the 10th of November. I confirmed within the letter that the purpose of the appeal hearing was to review the original decision to dismiss the claimant on the grounds that she felt the decision was unfair. During the appeal hearing, I asked the claimant to explain why she felt the decision to dismiss her was unfair. The claimant explained that she wasn't provided with any evidence prior to the disciplinary hearing. She explained that she was given a uh, given statement during the disciplinary hearing, but said there was no evidence that they were true. I reviewed all evidence gathered prior to the appeal hearing and considered that there was no reason to believe that the individuals who gave statements would not be telling the truth. The claimant continued to say that the decision was unfair and that she believed the real reason to, um, to be because of the fact that she had recently disclosed a diagnosis of depression and anxiety. She felt that Mr. Sparks didn't like the fact that the respondent had to make adjustments to her working conditions. I explained to the claimant that as this did not form part of her initial appeal, I would not be in a position to respond to this or take in, into consideration in determining whether to uphold her appeal. The claimant also stated that she was owed three days holiday, which she has not been paid for. Again, as this was not put forward as a ground for appeal, I advised the claimant that I could not take into consideration or respond to it. After hearing the claimant's appeal, I did not consider that she put forward any evidence or basis for me to overturn the decision to dismiss her. The claimant's main grounds of appeal was that she felt the witness statements provided by colleagues may not have been true. Again, I had no reason to believe this to be the case. I decided that the decision to dismiss the claimant would be upheld. I confirmed this to her at the conclusion of the appeal hearing and confirmed the decision would be sent to her in writing. I wrote to the claimant on 10th of November 2023, confirming the decision to uphold her dismissal. Thank you, Mr. Trent. Mr. Frew, cross examination, I suspect you don't need to be very long. Uh, I won't be long at all, Judge. Uh, Mr. Trent, uh, <clears throat> can, can I assume that you've had no training in relation to hearing appeals? Uh, yeah, this was my first appeal. I've had training with uh, disciplinaries and grievances. All oh, right, thank you. And how about discrimination? Any training? Uh, no real training on discrimination, no. And when the claimant raised with you uh, her understanding of the real reason for the dismissal, and that's set out at page 54 of the bundle, that's the, the, the hearing on the 10th of November, 
the real reason uh, was because the company uh, had to be lenient with her because of her diagnosis of anxiety and that her consideration was that Mr. Sparks was unhappy. If she's right, she couldn't possibly be dismissed. Do you agree? Um, I don't think she was right. Um, I think the allegations speak for itself and it had nothing to do with her uh, diagnosis. Yes. It, I'll ask one more time. If she was right, she couldn't possibly be dis dismissed. Do you agree? Yeah. You do. <coughs> and on that basis, you decided not to even to ask Mr. Sparks about her allegation or mitigation about his behaviour. Yes? That's correct. And that's because she hadn't raised it in writing before the appeal. That's correct. Do you appreciate that there was a wholesale failure in your lack of investigation, which led to an unfair dismissal? No. Held? No, I felt her grounds of appeal uh, were in writing. Um, that gave me enough time to prepare what the appeal hearing um, would be about. And the fact that then she raised new allegations uh, or new grounds of appeal within the hearing, I felt like um, she should have popped that in writing for me. Yeah, she did raise it in the disciplinary hearing as well. Did you read the notes of the disciplinary hearing? I did. You did. So it wasn't new to you because you'd read that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you accept then that it was a failure on well, your part? Yes, it was in the disciplinary hearing, but like I said, it was never raised as a ground for appeal. All right, thank you. Now, this meeting lasted for 10 minutes approximately, am I correct? 10 yeah, minutes for the appeal. that's about right. Yeah. And you carried out no further investigation? Uh, I didn't feel the need to. Quite. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. Short and sweet, thank you. Please turn to your seat. So that is the evidence. Um, for the respondent in his own standard. Super, thank you very much. So we'll move now to evidence um, on behalf of the claimant. And Mrs. Green is going to give her evidence. Mrs. Green, if you could come forward, thank you very much. We should assume you've done the affirmation yes, as well. Sir. Very nice to see you, Super. Thank you very much. Take a seat. If you can find your witness statement. If you start from paragraph two, please. I had been suffering from symptoms related to anxiety and depression since June 2022. I did not take any sick leave as I did not want to feel like a burden on the company. I was formally diagnosed by my own GP with anxiety and depression in September 2023, around two months prior to my dismissal. My doctor prescribed me with antidepressants. I immediately informed Mark Sparks, my line manager, of my diagnosis, and he was initially supportive of my condition. Reasonable adjustments were implemented, namely allowing me to start a little later to take my tablets and prepare for work, but also allowing me a longer lunch break in order to rest. I felt that Mark Sparks was very supportive of my diagnosis until 1st November 2023. On 1st November 2023, he invited me to an investigation meeting whereby he accused me of using my phone whilst on shift and being rude and aggressive towards customers. The meeting was very short, but I felt I did not get the opportunity to respond to any points raised by Mark. I was not suspended. In the meeting, he mentioned witness statements but refused to disclose these to me. I was subsequently I, I subsequently received an invite to a disciplinary hearing by Sophie Wood, who's the store manager, on 6 November 2023, for a disciplinary hearing to be held on the 7th of November 2023. I was not provided with any evidence with the invite letter that the company sought to rely upon in the hearing. During the disciplinary hearing on 7th November 2023, Mark Sparks was present as note taker. This made me feel anxious. Sophie provided me with the evidence, including witness statements. I had no time to review these statements and Sophie did not adjourn the hearing in order to allow me to review the same. I felt under pressure to review the documents with Sophie, with Sophie sitting opposite me, watching. 
As, as such, I did not read all the witness statements thoroughly, but from my recollection, they were very brief. I obtained a witness statement from my colleague, Arthur King, who I know very well and have worked with on numerous occasions. His statement confirmed that I had not accessed my phone or displayed any rude or aggressive behaviour towards customers. I provided Arthur King's statement to Sophie and it seemed that she did not read the statement. She took it from me, briefly looked at it and put it in the bottom of her paperwork in front of me. The disciplinary hearing was very similar to the investigation meeting, whereby I felt I was not afforded the opportunity to respond to the allegations. I felt the meetings were conducted as more of a tick box exercise rather than a genuine attempt to investigate the allegations. I was subsequently dismissed within the hearing without notice. So if you handed me the outcome letter during the hearing, which to me, shows that she had drafted this letter prior to me attending the hearing and would have issued the outcome regardless of anything I had to say. I genuinely believe that the real reason for my dismissal was Mark's disapproval at my diagnosis. Although he made reasonable adjustments to accommodate me, I felt he had to do this, but, he, but I did feel a shift in attitude towards me since I disclosed my diagnosis. In addition, it was clear that the disciplinary process was unfair. I was not afforded the opportunity to review the documents prior to the hearing. Mark was in attendance as a note taker after conducting the investigation meeting with me. And in my view, a predetermined outcome was issued. The outcome letter stated that I had a right to appeal. I exercised this right and emailed Mark on the 8th of November to state how I felt the company dismissed me completely unfair. I do not think the company handled the process correctly. I was subsequently invited to an appeal he hearing by Arnold Trent, an area manager. He sent me an invite letter on the 9th of November, 2023. The hearing was held on the 10th of November, 2023. But similarly, as with the investigation meeting and disciplinary hearing, I felt that I was not given the opportunity to put forward my case. In the hearing, I explained that I had only I had sight of the witness statements in the hearing. Arnold's response to this was that it was unlikely that the statements would be lying. From this, I felt yet again a decision had already been made without taking my explanations into consideration. I also informed Arnold of my colleague's statement, which supported my case. He ignored this. I also raised that I felt the real reason for my dismissal was my diagnosis and how Mark was unhappy with the special treatment I was receiving due to my condition. I also mentioned that I had not been paid my holiday pay. Arnold responded with, bo with both points stating that I had not listed these points in my appeal letter and therefore he was unable to consider these points. I was shocked at his response. It felt to me he was not interested in anything I had to say. Again, this hearing was very short and he confirmed the outcome in the meeting to me, namely that the decision to dismiss me had been upheld and that my diagnosis had nothing to do with the, with the dismissal, despite Arnold not even investigating into this point. I believe that my dismissal was unfair and that the real reason for my dismissal was my recent diagnosis. The whole disciplinary process was completely unfair from start to finish. Super, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so Mr Langaratney, cross-examination from you. Thank you, Judge. Um, afternoon, Mrs Green. <clears throat> um, let's just um, set out a few things just for clarification background. So, started working for the respondent on the 1st of January, 2020, yes? Yeah, New Year's Day. And um, we'll obviously come on to the events leading up to your dismissal shortly, um, but your dismissal was on the 7th of November, 23, yes? Yes. So your employment ended that day? Yes. Um, can I refer you to page four of the bundle, um, five or 64 for those PDFs? It's the, Sorry, what, what page? Page four, it's the ET1 uh, form, and it's, Section five of it at the bottom, employment details, you see that? Um, I'm just going to. Okay. 
Section five uh, of the employment details. It, it's, it, it's, oh yeah. It, specifically, it says where your uh, if your employment has ended, when did it end? You say there that ended on the tenth of November, twenty twenty three. That that that's incorrect, isn't it? Oh yeah. Fine, we'll move on. Um, your role as a store assistant, um, that's customer facing, isn't it? Yes. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, you're dealing with customers quite yes. regularly, frequently. Yes. That's a core part of your job, yes? Yes. Okay. We'll come back to that, but um, let's go to the issue of your um, disability. So not in dispute that um, you have anxiety, depression, Yes, I do. Um, when did you first develop those conditions? It's as per the statement. Okay, so is that is it correct to say you say you developed it in June 22? Correct. Okay, um, but you didn't see a GP straight away, did you? No, um, I was uh, speaking to friends about how I was feeling and there's quite a lot available online if you search your symptoms. Um, so I did try um, some of the recommendations online, but realised um, it wasn't helping me, and so I did seek help from my GP. Mm. But um, between June 2022 and September 2023, when you got the diagnosis, mm. uh, you didn't tell your employer about your health condition, did you? No. Okay. So you first told your employer about um, your health conditions when you got diagnosed in September 23. Yes, but they knew because there were times when. I was on shift where I felt like I couldn't cope, especially if there was a long queue, it would make me anxious and I would ask Mark if I could have a time out and he didn't, he didn't like it when I said that, but he would let me have a time out. So, and I said to him that I'm starting to feel anxious, the queues make me feel really hot and bothered and some customers are quite rude, which increases me. Okay, if you anxious. pause a moment, let's but, just, but, if we just focus on the rude. question. Uh, just to be clear, though, um, you only told Mr. Sparks uh, about your health conditions when you were diagnosed in September 23. I told him when my GP diagnosed me, yes. But before then, I was telling him I was feeling anxious. Yeah, well, I've read paragraph five of your statement, Mrs. Green, where you seem to accept that he was supportive until November 23. Yes. There we are. So when you told Mr. Sparks off your diagnosis, um, straight away, immediately, there were some reasonable adjustments implemented, yes? Yes. How soon after? Um, his first uh, question to me was, um, he needs to uh, speak to Sophie Woods and find out what to do. So he didn't really know what to do, but he was quite sympathetic. And then he came back to me and said, oh, I need to get an occupational health report. Mm -hmm. I explained that I need to take some medication and I need to take it before I start my shift. And um, I could do with a, a bit longer. I sh lunch breaks just go so fast and I don't always feel rested in my lunch break. So he gave me a bit longer. But they were um, adjustments that occupational health confirmed as well. So occupational health confirmed that. And uh, Mr. Sparks, you say, was quite sympathetic. Yeah, to start off with. Mm. Uh, paragraph five of your statement, you go as far as saying he was very supportive of your diagnosis. Yeah. And so that rather paints a picture that he was actually quite supportive. The employer was supportive of your health conditions, yes? He, he certainly was supportive to start off with, but it was quickly obvious that he... He was getting fed up with me taking a longer lunch break and now, now he you, had to you, just shift. So, sorry to interrupt, me. Mrs. Green, but you say that it was quite obvious, but th there's nothing to the to this that end in your witness statement uh, about the examples of when Mr. Sparks um, took issue with your disability, is there? No. Uh, and there's no evidence in the bundle, emails or otherwise, evidence in Mr. Sparks being um, at unease about your disabilities, is there? No. Uh, I suspect that the witness was about to explain in evidence about that. Well, um, be careful, Mr. Frew. It's the witness's evidence that I want, not yours. Yes. The witness has answered the question. Well, she was interrupted, Judge. Well, if you may, if okay. you wish to why don't you not interrupt me, Mr. Frew? Forgive me, Judge. Let me speak. The way this works for me, for my benefit, is that if I hear the question, I can have the answer. 
And if we allow both sides to ask and answer their various bits, it'll help me most. So we pause for a moment. You've acknowledged there's nothing in your statement or in the evidence that shows Mr. Sparks to have had a, an adverse attitude towards you following your diagnosis. That's the evidence that I've heard. I don't think she's interrupted. Next question, Mr. Inventor. Thank you, Judge. Um, so it's your case, just to be clear, um, Mrs. Green, that uh, suddenly on the 1st of November, 23, Mr. Sparks changed his tune and wasn't sympathetic to your health conditions. Is that correct? His behaviour towards me, in comparison to how he was treating others, was blatantly different. You say treating others. Um, can you give an example of that? Well, he would um, ask me um, if I could be quicker serving teas and coffees. He would, he would only come to me to go and pick the trays when other people were standing around. Now, now you've said this now in evidence, thank you, but that didn't again feature on your witness statement. Why? Because I focused on the fact that he just dismissed me unfairly. OK, but the, the premise of your claim, one of your claims, is that um, you were dismissed because the employer didn't want to deal with your disability. Is that right? He was discriminating against me. OK, so you don't think it would have been sensible to include these examples on your witness statement? I have made clear in my statement that he changed after the 1st of November and I, my opportunity to tell you is now. We'll move on, um, Mrs Green. Let's go to page 41. Uh, this is the notes from the investigatory meeting held by Mr Sparks. Just let me know when you've got there. I'm there. Thank you. So um, you're invited to an investigatory meeting on the 1st of November, yes? Yeah. Um, and uh, Mr Sparks in that meeting made it clear that there were a number of allegations um, that had come into light in respect to your conduct at work, yes? Not to start off with. Well, well let's look at the um, notes from the, this meeting. You can see that uh, a few lines down, um, it says MS informed uh, CG that there have been a number of allegations which have come to light in respect of CG's conduct. Um, it then goes on to say MS informed CG uh, that is alleged that she used her mobile phone whilst on shift to access social media. You see that, yeah? Yeah, but can I just add, please, that I've never seen these notes before. No one asked me to check them if I agree with the contents. Did, did you ever ask to um, see these notes? I did. I said, could I have a copy? And he said, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you know if I can give you them. Yeah, you say that, but um, that's not mentioned in your statement, um, nor is there any evidence to demonstrate that you have made that request, is there? It's not in my statement, I'm telling you. That yeah. I've never seen these notes. What about the notes of disciplinary hearing? I've never seen them before. Did you ask for those as well? No. Sorry, afterwards, did you ask to see those to see if they were accurate? No. Right, OK. It's not. But they were never given to me anyway. No, it's not, it's not very satisfactory, is it? Mrs Green, did, did you uh, take your own notes in this meeting? No, because I was ambushed. Well, yeah, you say you were ambushed, but um, this was a formal meeting with your line manager, Mr Sparks, yes? Yeah. Now... Um, in that meeting, a number of um, things were done. Um, one of the things um, that was done was that you were referred to the respondent's mobile phone policy, weren't you? Yes. Shall we go to that mobile phone policy, page 35 to start off with? It starts on page 35, but if we go on to page 36, uh, paragraph 3 in particular, mm. Now, just before we uh, go into that specific section, um, this policy um, you received when you started employment, yes? Oh, yes, we get lots of policies, we just ask to sign them. Mm. But you, you had um, read this policy before, though, haven't you? I was given this policy to sign. Mm. So you, are you saying then that you weren't aware of the contents of the policy? Well, I flicked through them because you only get five, ten minutes and you have to sign it and then it goes in the personnel file. Well, you can see at paragraph 
3.1, um, it says clearly to limit any interference with an employee's work, personal mobile phones should be turned off and placed out of sight during working hours. Uh, if an emergency call uh, needs to be made by an employee, they should speak to a line manager. Um, so you accept that the use of personal mobile phones during working hours is prohibited as, this per, as per this policy? As per this back policy, yeah. yeah. But it's so, common sense as well, isn't it? Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, you're working. Oh. As you can say, you're seeing coffee. Can't be on your phone. No, quite. So if you were to breach this policy, uh, you might expect your employer to react accordingly and possibly um, institute some disciplinary proceedings. I'll expect them to have a word, if need to be honest. Mm. OK, well, let, let's go to um, page 37 and paragraph 7. Uh, which starts with breach of this policy. Um, it's the second, it's the third sentence, uh, the final sentence at paragraph 7.1, right at the bottom of page 37. It says, inappropriate use of um, company um, to telephony instruction or mobile phones. Uh, may be treated as gross misconduct and could result in summary termination of employment. Um, so you can see there uh, that uh, inappropriate use of mobile phones may be treated as gross misconduct and may uh, result in summary uh, termination. I can see that. Yeah. Um, so so if, if someone was to use a mobile phone inappropriately, um, it could be deemed gross misconduct. You accept that as per this policy. But I don't. What's inappropriate? What What does the policy mean by that? Well, uh, I'm the one asking the question, Mrs. Green. I think the point, Mrs. Green, is that um, if you do use your phone for personal use, you can't be surprised if you end up being disciplined for it. Oh, I see. Okay. And would you agree that that's fair? That according to this, yeah. Now, uh, if we go back to page 41 of the investigation lease from the first. Page, page 41? 41, please, Ms. Green. Oh, the notes I've never seen. Yeah. Um, you can see towards the bottom, um, Mr. Sparks makes it clear that he'll investigate this allegation, these allegations further. Uh, but it will likely result in a disciplinary hearing. You can see that towards the bottom. Yeah, yeah I can see you put that in his yeah. notes. So you accept he warned you of the potential um, or, uh, possibility of a disciplinary hearing following this investigation, yes? Sorry, can you just say that again? Um, you, you accept that in this meeting, Mr Sparks warned you a disciplinary hearing might follow. Oh yeah, it was, it, the meeting was only a few minutes, but he did make that point. Uh, and you said in this meeting that um, he asked you whether you had anything further to add. You said you could obtain a statement from your colleague, yes? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Mr Sparks says that he'll consider it, yes? He, yeah, he just shrugged his shoulder and said, OK. Mm. Well, he didn't deny you the opportunity to present evidence of your own, did he? No, I said I was going to do that. And that's Mr King, you did. Is yeah, that right? Yeah. Page 46. It's my good friend, Arthur. We'll come back to Mr King um, later. Uh, let's go to page 44. It's, your, it's the um, letter from the 6th of November inviting you to a disciplinary hearing. Do you recall being sent this letter Mrs. Green. Oh no, I wasn't sent it, I was given it. Yeah, okay. So do you, you recall receiving it, yes? Yeah, at the, at the disciplinary hearing with yeah. Sophie. Do um, I it in an envelope? The letter. No, this is the one before. Oh, the invite, the, the yeah. Invite I remember giving, being given this one as well. Yeah, okay. So you can see there on the first paragraph, it mentions that the purpose of the hearing is to consider the allegations of gross misconduct. Yeah. yeah? And there are three allegations set out um, at, uh, uh, in that letter, yes? Yeah. Now, um, it's also mentioned in this letter that um, two employees have provided witness statements 
mm -hmm. confirm and you were on the phone during working hours, yes? <coughs> yeah. And it also um, says that the company received feedback from a customer uh, alleging slow service and that you were displaying rude and aggressive behaviour towards them. Yeah. So um, that is three people altogether um, that provided witness evidence against you. Yes, you agree with that? That's what it says. Yeah. It, it, it also in this letter um, says that if you want to call relevant witness, uh, witnesses to the hearing, um, you can do so. Yeah. Did you feel you had the opportunity then to take witnesses with you if you thought? Well, not really, because I didn't know what these other witnesses were saying. So I, I, how I, I didn't, I didn't, have, I didn't get a copy of the disciplinary process. So I was just giving these letters with such short, short notice. I couldn't, I didn't even have time to call ACAS. Well, um, you, you say you don't know what the witnesses were saying, uh, but in this letter on page forty-four. Three allegations are listed. So you had an idea of what they were saying, didn't you? Yeah, they're, 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 they're making up lies about me, yeah? well, but I don't know who was saying that. I might think it's pretty clear from page 44 you knew exactly what was being said. I think that's the point, isn't it? It's pretty obvious yeah. from 44. Oh, yeah, they accused me of using my phone, but yeah. I didn't know who was doing it. Hmm. Because you've got Mr Arthur King's uh, writer statement in support of you. Yeah. We can go to that, page 46. 46? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. You got uh, Arthur King wrote a statement of you, so it's abundantly clear that you didn't know what the allegations were. Well, I knew that I'm being accused of using my phone. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't call Mr King to give evidence at the disciplinary hearing, though, did you? No, I thought my statement would be enough. Just the last couple of minutes, Mr. Dylan Thank um, you, Judge. Perhaps if we look at page 47, which is the uh, disciplinary hearing itself, um, if I yeah. can help. I, perhaps I'll just, sorry, I'll ask this question. I was going to ask it at the end. Anyway, um, you got to see the witness statements in the middle of the disciplinary hearing. They were given to me, and I had about five minutes, and I was feeling super anxious. Um, Sophie was sat opposite me. It was, I mean, I didn't really even get time to read them properly. They were only short, but given I need, you know, I was feeling anxious. No one cared. It was just shoved in front of me. Well, um, let, let's um, go to that very issue. So um, you were given a chance to read the um, statements provided um, from colleagues and the customer feedback form, yes? Yeah, I was given them. I don't feel like five minutes is a chance to read them. But you accept that these statements were very brief, um, don't you? Yeah. So you wouldn't have, in any event, needed that long to read them. But I would have needed more than five minutes. Did you, at any point during this hearing, ask for an adjournment? No, because I was already feeling anxious being there. That may be so, Miss Green, Mrs Green, but if you needed more time to read the statements, why didn't you ask? Uh, Miss Wood, whether there could be an adjournment to give you more time. But I was constantly mentioning that I feel that as part of this process, I've mentioned so many times that I wasn't given adequate time to do prepare or to have the documents to look at beforehand. But you accept, uh, Mrs. Green, that um, in the um, disciplinary uh, letter inviting you to one, um, Sophie Wood sets out page 45. Now, if you have any specific needs that we're hearing as a result of disability, uh, please contact her as soon as possible. You didn't do that, did you? Well, she gave me this um, on the afternoon and I had to be in the disciplinary the next morning, so I don't know when she expected me to contact her. There was still some time to contact her and, and she ask knew, her to make she knew adjustments. I had Well, the simple truth is you, you didn't ask for an adjournment, nor did you ask for more time to consider the statements, did you? So that's my job to do that. So is the answer no? I didn't ask no. Thank you. Last couple of minutes. And a question, please. Returning back to the statement from um, Arthur King, you mentioned earlier you have a close relationship. Um, oh, yes, my friend. Okay. So you socialise out of work, do you? No. 
We go on lunch breaks together sometimes. But he's a, he is a friend, though. It's fair to he's say. my mate. Yeah. And so he's probably likely to, to back you up regardless, right? Well, that so sounds like a comment. Friends. That sounds like a comment rather than a question. <clears throat> he can't speak, um, and his witness statement doesn't speak to the allegations um, that were put to you. It doesn't comment on specific dates, does it? Say that again. His witness statement doesn't comment on specific dates, does it? No. So he's worked with me on so many occasions. So I know, this, I know, and he's been with the company five years. So, for example, he can't um, speak to the allegation made against you on the 27th of October, 23, uh, where you were alleged to have become rude and aggressive towards a customer. No. Super. Have you got any final questions now? Mr. Ilangaratni, please. Um, going then um, to um, the dismissal, you're of course notified about your dismissal in the hearing itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is after um, Miss Wood had considered all the evidence, yes? She just had a, a, a letter on a table in an envelope. But um, she, if you go, if you look at page 47, she asked you whether there's anything you want to add. So you had a proper opportunity to put your case, didn't you? She did ask me if there's anything I want to add. Well, it's a fair question. Yeah. The question is, you had a proper opportunity to put your case at that hearing. I don't feel I had a proper opportunity to prepare. So I couldn't really have a proper opportunity to put my case forward. And uh, beyond Mr. King's um, statement, you didn't provide any further evidence, no. did you? And so you have nothing um, in terms of substantial evidence to link uh, your dismissal to your health conditions, do you? It's but just your I, belief, isn't it? No, it's not my belief, because other people I've seen use phones and they've not been treated like this. Well, uh, you say other people, but you've not mentioned anything about that in your statement, have you? Well, I didn't think I had to. No. no. Right, so, super, thank you very much. So that concludes your cross-examination. Mr. Frew, do you have any re-examination? I don't. Thank you, Judge. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. You'll be relieved to hear that's your evidence um, concluded. Thank you, Judge. Super. Right. We've concluded this phase of the hearing. You've heard the evidence.